our memory verse this week is found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We are thankful for that verse to place in our memory banks and in our our baskets to remember in difficult times that his peace transcends all understanding. And uh, we're blessed this morning to uh, have a take a special time in our service for a uh, baby dedication. Amen. And um, Pastor Gary, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to. I'm going to ask you to come up here and give me a hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I, I can tell. I'm going I'm to need your help here in a minute. Uh, you know, yeah, come on up on the front row, Pastor Gary. Um, and, uh, wow. All right. So I'm going to call the Nelson family to come up front. Okay. Yep, that's that's good right there. Okay, and then I'm gonna ask um, I'm gonna ask if uh, Zuri's godmother would come up here. <laughs> and now I'm gonna ask uh, Zuri's grandmother to come up here. And now I'm going to ask uh, Zuri's cousin to come up here. Cousins. Auntie, you're not going to get forgotten. We got one more auntie in the back, and we understand. And then, uh, and we have a grand uncle and grand auntie here. So y'all come up. One of the privileges of, of being a pastor is to, to dedicate babies. And um, Zuri is a special child. <laughs> Hey, look at when I called her name. Oh, name. And uh, we are committing today with her father and mother and sisters to dedicate her to the Lord. And um, I was reading in my office before, just in preparation. You know, the the biblical example is found in in First Samuel. And Hannah, as she uh, dedicated Samuel and prayed to God. And as I was reading, I I came across this. And um, Stephanie, you'll appreciate this because of our conversations. I said, um, Hannah's prayer shows us that that all we have and receive is on loan from God. Hannah might not have had many excuses for being a possessive mother, or might have had many excuses for being a possessive mother. But God, but when God answered her prayer, she followed through on her promise to dedicate Samuel to God's service. She discovered that the greatest joy in having a child is to give that child willingly and freely back to God. She entered motherhood prepared to do what all mothers must eventually do, let go of their children. When children are born, they are completely dependent upon their parents for all the basic necessities. This causes some parents to forget that those same children will grow toward independence. And Stephanie, I thought about this when, within a span of a few short years. <laughs> 
being sensitive to the different stages of that healthy process will greatly strengthen family relationships. Resisting or denying that process will cause great pain. We must gradually let go of our children in order to allow them to become mature and interdependent adults. Church, what we see before us is a family that has dedicated themselves to the Lord across generations. Missouri being now the newest addition of that dedication. So we are thankful for the Nelson family, for her father and her mother, and their decision to come before the church and to let us know that they are dedicating her to God. We have the privilege of joining together with them in prayer, in support, along with the other generations of their family. You see before us represent representatives of our good friend and brother in the Lord, Walter Love. Let it not be lost on us that we have this privilege. Let it not be lost on us that heaven rejoices today as we celebrate and as we dedicate Zuri Hope Nelson to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, our gracious and loving God, you alone are worthy of our praise. And Lord, on this day, we stand to support Eli and Stephanie in their decision to dedicate Zuri to you. Father, we stand not only as in support, but we stand with this family, with the legacy that not only does she carry, but that she becomes a part of. Lord, we know. We know that now in heaven, there are those rejoicing. Our dear brother Walter and our dear sister Patricia. We thank you for the representation of each one of their children. We thank you for across generations. You have been good, gracious, loving, and merciful. So we pray, Lord, that you would protect Zuri, that she'd grow up, Lord, in the admonishment of knowing you are God and how gracious and loving you are, Lord Jesus, that you sacrificed your life for her. So we pray her protection until that day when she professes you as her Savior, Lord. We pray that as she grows, as she grows strong, not only physically, mentally, but also spiritually. And we pray, Lord, in anticipation of the day when we'll get a chance to celebrate with her her decision to follow you as a disciple. So, Lord, bless this family. Bless all who have come to celebrate this momentous occasion in the life of this family. So we pray you bless the, the Nelson household. Bless Zuri's grandmother, godmother, aunts, cousins, great aunts, great uncles. Lord, great-grandmothers. You are good, God. Thank you for your presence. 
Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your blessing. It's in your mighty and precious name, Jesus, that I pray. With joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I was emotional. That's uh, there's a lot that goes, a lot that uh, could be said. And, uh, thankful for the privilege. Um, you know, when your son and daughter ask you to dedicate their baby, there's no, there's no, there's no saying no. And I don't, I don't joke by, and I'm not trying to be um, assumptuous, or it's not the right word. I can't think of the right word right now. But um, uh, Eli and Stephanie are my son and daughter. I don't care what anybody said. I'll take that one to the mat. So that's just just it. That's just the way it is. That's what it's going to be. Um, I drive by their house and check on them. I don't need to stop. I just drive by. I think Grandma's car was in the driving, driveway a couple days ago. Y'all think I'm... Who drives the white Buick? See? See, y'all thought I was kidding. Oh, I know. I know. Who drives away? I know this white Buick in the driveway. I, I checked it out. Love you guys, and thank you for the privilege of, of asking me to do that. And uh, thank you, Pastor Gary. I know you know. I know you know why. Um, I asked him to come up. I know he knows why. And so... Um, our intercessory prayer time is uh, we're expanding on uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and our ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, the mountains quake with their surging. When I was praying through this particular psalm, and I don't know if you, well, for me, it was time when it was on the news was a lot of what was happening down in Florida with the collapse of the building. And I know that, I don't know all of the details and, and understand all of that, but it just, it caught me that in that shaking and that rubble, that God still is our strength. And he still is our refuge. And then when it went from rescue to recovery, and they started just, you know, and the, and the body count started increasing in the news, I just thought about, you know, how God was, was making it possible for those first responders and, and those folks that are there doing that recovery. Uh, they need strength. Need to look beyond just, I mean, they're forced because of their profession to look beyond the cause, but, you know, their, their task is recovering the bodies. And, uh, and they need the strength of God to do that. Because there's just no way that you could do that in your own strength, you know, in your own accord. And so I thought about that and, and continued to pray through the 46th Psalm. But I was also thinking about some of the folks in our congregation they are going through difficult things, the loss of loved ones. And as we keep adding to the list of families that are grieving, and we thank you for your steadfastness to, 
to trust God and to honor God. Even in, in the midst of that, you, I know you're, you're hurting emotionally, not being able to gather or uh, not knowing all of the details, but yet you're still worshiping God. And so he is, again, providing your strength and is your refuge. And I thought of also the, those who are going through health issues. And, um, you know, this morning at the, the early service, someone asked about uh, Sister Diane. And I didn't know that Sister Diane had been uh, not feeling well. So we stepped out and called her, and she answered, and um, she's doing well. Just decided to take some rest today and stay home. She wasn't feeling 100%, but she's feeling better. And then uh, we want to pray for um, Mrs. Parker, Pastor Gary's mother, and uh, Charlene and Brenda's grandmother. I want to pray for her and pray for her health and uh, her strength and her recovery. And um, many others, and I, I don't mean to, I'm looking at this list, and there are so many on the list, but God knows each and every one of them. And uh, he knows them far better than we do. The list is for us. He doesn't need a list. He knows them. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we come to you today in prayer. Lord, we ask you again to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness so that nothing will hinder our prayer. We pray for those, Father, who are in the middle of life's shaking, in the middle of circumstances and situations that may feel like an earthquake may feel like a tidal wave, may feel like just overcoming them with anxiousness and anxiety, hurt, pain. You, Father, know those of whom we are concerned. In fact, Father, you know them better than we do. You know that we care about them and we care about their struggles. which are too big for us to solve or to take care of. They're too painful for us to truly bring comfort. So we ask you now to bless them, to be with them. Please deliver them, Father, from the shaking, the anxiousness, the overwhelming feeling of being, engulfed, of being engulfed by the tidal wave of concern and of problems. You, Father, are our only true hope. Jesus, you are our only sure Redeemer. So it is in your name, Lord, that we pray. Father, I ask as well, that you would hide me behind the cross. That you would think with my mind and speak with my voice. Lord, I stand in obedience to the calling you've placed upon my life. And I ask you, God, to use me this day as your instrument. Lord, allow me to preach the message you've put on my heart. With boldness. With clarity with love and may Lord the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you O Lord my strength and my redeemer for it's in your name I pray with joy thanksgiving and forgiveness of sin Amen 
Turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, we're going to pick up again in this miracle of Jesus healing the blind man. And we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 9 at verse 13, and we're going to conclude at verse 34. They brought the Pharisees, or they brought to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. And the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. We know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind but now I see. You heard that somewhere, haven't you? Then they, then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already. You did not listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple? We are disciples of Moses. We know that Moses, that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, or the man answered, now this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of the opening of the eyes of a blind before, a man blind before. This, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Well, obviously, you know this morning that our title comes from verse 34. Thrown out for Jesus. They threw this man out. And what we're looking at, and we get a chance to just kind of drop in, I just want to remind us, we're dropping into this argument between the Pharisees and the, the leaders in the temple of who Jesus was that began over in chapter 7 and it's going to conclude in chapter 10. And here this man who was probably sitting alongside of the road on the way to the synagogue, Jesus walks up to him, he was born blind and he makes mud and puts it on the man's eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam and he goes and he comes back and he can see. And there, this debate comes up as to who Jesus was. 
Forgetting about the miracle, forgetting about the fact that this man who was blind from birth now can see, they're more concerned with who Jesus is and what's going on. They're casting aside the miracle. And so the, the, the four things that I just want to bring to your attention today is this list of, first of all, this list of questions that are asked. There's questions that are asked by the Pharisees. There's questions that are asked by his parents. And then there are questions that are asked by the blind man. The, the questions that are, are asked, the, the reactions or the responses to the questions are, are quite varied. And in fact, the, 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 first of all, the leaders, they, they ask him, the Pharisees, they ask this man, what do you have to say about him, about Jesus? They're asking him, and, and can you imagine that? Can, can, this man who's been born blind, and let's just, let's just for, for argument's sake today, and I don't know too many of us that don't like to be argumentative at some point in time. But let's just say that this man was 21 years old. Amen? For all of us that are parents, he's out of, because he, it says he's of age, amen? So we know that he's at least 21, because 18 didn't matter. But, um, that's another sermon on another day. I'm not going to mess with that. But here he is, let's just say he's 21, and he's been, he was been blind from birth, and they come up to him and ask him, what do you have to say about him? What a ridiculous question. What do you have to say about the man who took some mud, put it on your eye, told you to go wash, you did it, and now you can see? I don't know about you, but I'll be saying, he's a great guy. He's an awesome guy. Where's he at? I'm going to hang with him because he has healed me of something that's been a burden on my life for 20 years. It affected my parents because remember now, as a blind person in their society, he's not just welcomed in, he's cast out. He's on the fringes, he's sitting by the side of the road and his profession is begging for money. But his life's been changed. Well, then the, the Pharisees said, well, you know, obviously they're, they're realizing, well, we're not going to have too good of an argument with him because he's pretty excited. He's, his life's been changed. We better leave him alone. Let's go get his mom and daddy. And, and, he, and they go get the parents and they say to the parents, so is this your son? Now, they've taken care of him for, as we said, at least 20 years or 21 years. And, and so they're well, um, yeah, the, yeah, he's ours. And they kind of like, you know how, you know, how, as parents, how, how we, we sometimes, when our kids act up, we, we momentarily cast him to the other parent, to our, y'all you know, don't, y'all don't do that? We, we've, we've done that a few times, you know. You know, when, when, they, when they do something that they're not supposed to do, then it's their child, it's your, your child. And so now here, here these parents have been placed in this situation that they're asking them, and they're, they're kind of at this point, they're together, they admit that the son is theirs, but now they're probably looking around like going, oh, well, uh, well, he's of age, ask him. So they're, they're, they're stepping back saying, hey, it's not, no, we don't have anything to do. If it's, go to him now. He's old enough to speak for himself. And then they, ask, again, they ask this, this, this blind man, you know, how did he open your eyes? And, and I have to, when I was reading this, again, in verse 27, when he answers, I mean, he's kind of, and that's why I say he's 21, because his response has a little bit of attitude. Do you see it? When he says, I've told you already. Now, I know, I know, young folks, I know you don't ever respond to your parents that way. I know I never responded to my parents before like that. 
Heaven helped me, right? But he says, you did not listen. He says, I've explained this to you guys. I've told you about this. You didn't listen. You must want to, you, you, why do you want to hear it again? You must want to become one of his disciples. And like, oh, and look at their reaction. They hurled insults at him. So the Pharisees, they're, they're, so in this questions, the questions of this chapter, we can see some things, some dynamics are going on. Well, in fact, it reveals there's a division amongst the Pharisees. The Pharisees are divided into two groups. One that believes, look over at verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. They're concerned with, the, so this happened on the Sabbath day, and that's their concern. Totally discounting that this man who was born blind can now see. You would think that they would say, wow, what a, what a touch from God. How glorious is the Lord that he touched you. And then others of them, that's one group of the, them. The others said, well, how could a sinner do miraculous signs? They're, again, discounting that they won't even name him. They won't even say Jesus. They won't even allow themselves to say that. Because what the parents already had said, what's going on, that they had already decided that anybody who said that Jesus Christ, Jesus was the Christ, was getting kicked out of the synagogue. They're, they're, they're casting them out. And, if, and I guess the best way to understand this, if we really thought about it, is back in the day, there was a point, well, and maybe it's down south, down in the Bible Belt, You've probably heard of this, and, and maybe you have family that, goes, that is, lives down in that area. But in the Bible Belt, going to church is the right thing to do. It has nothing to do with salvation. It's about where you are. You need to go to church. And so this, this man's parents, this blind man's parents, they're being kicked out of the inner circle. I mean, you know, in, in the Bible Belt, if you're going to own a small business in town, you need to be part of some church. So your church knows, right? And you need to have something up in your window that says you're part of XYZ Church. And it's probably some, help me, Lord, some Baptist church somewhere. And then everybody, come, everybody from the other churches come because they know that you're part of that church, right? That happens in... Here, this, in this text, what's happening is that these, these Pharisees and these leaders in the temple have already made it perfectly clear that anybody who says that Jesus is the Christ is being cast out of that system, getting, being cast out of that community, out of that society. They're, they're no longer going to be thought of as people who are, are part of the community. They're, they're outcasts. And so this division is really, is really important to see, this division that, that cr these Pharisees have created. Because even without calling him Jesus, they're saying, well, if you don't keep the law and the Sabbath, and if you don't, there's no way that you could do this if you were a sinner, but he's definitely not Christ. He's definitely not the Son of God. It's the, really the, 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 the point that I want to make there. But I want to show you something else. Go back with me in, to chap, to, in, in chapter 9. Go back to verse 11. We didn't read it this morning. But in verse 11, so I want you to see something that happens with this blind man in, our, in, this, in this story. In, cha, in verse 11 of chapter 9, he's asked the first time about, or in, in verse 10, he's asked, how then were your eyes opened? And listen to his response in verse 11. So he replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed. I went and washed and then I could see. Look, just for a moment, just bear with me. The man they call Jesus. Then look over at verse 17. 
Again, he's getting that same question. When he asked, what do you have to say? It was your eyes he opened in verse 17. It says, the man replied, he is a prophet. Verse 11, he's the man called Jesus. Verse 17, he is a prophet. Then go to verse 33. Or better yet, go back to verse 30. So that we can make sure we know who's talking. The man answered, the blind man, now that is remarkable, he says. A little bit of sarcasm. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. Verse 33. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Don't let it pass. In this story... In John chapter 9, from the beginning to the end, we get a chance to see this man mature spiritually. His faith grows from the man called Jesus in verse 11 to a man who was from God in verse 33. I mean, this is the, the demonstration of maturing faith. He knew about Jesus in verse 11. But now after being asked a few times and, and gone through the experience, and now he can see he has a, a different response. He's, he's saying to them, he says to them, you all are saying it's remarkable to him that they don't know who he is, but yet he knows who he is. He's saying, I know who he is. He's a man from God. He's the son of God is what he's really trying to say. Because I know, because my eyes have been opened. Not only my physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes have been opened. So we literally go, we literally see in, in 30 verses, we see the transition of this man from being someone who knows about Jesus to someone who knows Jesus. And his life, is, his life has changed dramatically. Because he's gone from begging for a living to now he's going to have to get up probably and go to work. He's going to probably have to get a job. And not only that, but because of who he says Jesus is, he's going to get kicked out of the synagogue. I mean, he's, he had the opportunity to, now that he could see, he gets a chance to, to be in the inner circle, but he doesn't want to be in that inner circle. He wants to stand for Jesus. So he's willing to, to risk it all. And he does risk it all, literally. He gets expelled from the, from the synagogue, and he does something that's, that is incredible that I think we should catch, and I hope that we catch, is this man... He goes from believing to confessing to worshiping God. He's willing to put it all on the line. I mean, his, the, the growth of his faith is implied in this text. He's fearless in his confession of his healing. In fact, he gets, as I say, he gets a little sarcastic when they, they keep asking him. So, well, you, all, you obviously want to be one of his disciples. That's why you keep asking. Because he changes the narrative. It's not about his sight. It's about Jesus. Is what he's saying to them. You obviously aren't concerned about me. You want to know about him. And, and I, what I do know is that I was blind, but now I can see. He, he, he endured the hostility of the Pharisees and the leaders of the, of the synagogue. 
He endured the rejection from his parents who said, he's of age. We ain't got nothing to do with it. Y'all talk to him. We're staying in the community. We want to be well liked. We want to be part of the neighborhood watch. Amen. This man, he disregarded the consequences of being expelled from the, the, from the synagogue and he gives this brave confession and his response is so simple that we literally sing it in a hymn. Y'all probably didn't realize it. Did, did, did you get that? You, you got that? We, we sing this. And I, 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 didn't, I know y'all don't want me to sing. That's... <laughs> That's, that's a gift of the love family, not the slave family. Amen? Well, I should take that back. He, he can sing. There's some of, some of them who can sing. So just, just, I take out all that back. But anyway. You got me. Thank you, Charlene. You got me. This man was blind, but now he can see. And we have sung that. Even, even as off-key as we want to be, we have sung that we were blind, but now we can see. The simplicity of his response, his, his worship of the Son of God. My hope, my hope today is that our faith can grow like this man's faith. That we'd be willing to be thrown out for Jesus. Jesus. To not fit in, but to be willing to stand up and say, well, what he's done for me, I know. And I'm willing to share it with you. Do you want to be one of his disciples? Because what he has done for me, he can do for you. And he's willing to do that for you. Amen. Turn with me one more time. Romans chapter 10. And Paul in his eloquent words to the church at Rome. He explains what this man has just done. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. And then verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This blind man believed in his heart that Jesus had not only opened his eyes physically, but spiritually. And this man was so willing to open his mouth that he literally made the leaders of the synagogue mad. And they started hurling insults at him. Just so you know, just to be perfectly clear, when you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't expect the world to be clapping and cheering for you. They're going to be hurling insults. But this man, this blind man, this blind beggar that was sitting along the side of the road that didn't tell Jesus when he told him, go wash, said, well, let me pray about it. Let me think about it. Can I go next week? He went up and went. Or he got up and went. Brothers and sisters, I pray that we will get up and go. That we're willing to be thrown out. Thrown out of polite society. Thrown out of mediocrity or just ex merely existing. To be like this blind man. To be willing to risk it all for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. How you've guided and completed us. 
through your salvation, through your death, burial, and resurrection from the grave. Lord, thank you for this wonderful example of a life surrendered to you. Lord, may our faith mature from head knowledge of you being Jesus to heart knowledge of you being our Savior and Lord. May we in our lives surrender our will to yours. To have the courage as this blind man did to be willing to risk it all, to speak up, to ask people if they want to be disciples or become disciples too. Lord, we pray again that your word will not return unto your void, but would accomplish this day all that you would have it to accomplish. For it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Let's stand together.